take chapters and then you have you branch down there, so it's it's like a, a, a tree basically. So they can actually physically Yeah, exactly. We we yes. have message boards yeah. and interaction sites uh, through our, our main UK site. You can go there. Um, we've streamlined it a bit more now, so that it's easier for people to come to and see where they they might be able to play a role <laughs> and become involved and hopefully communicate with their local chapter and become a part of that, so that uh, they can go out and do many different events in their local area, help communicate to And this is about as physical as it gets. Is it Where's the headquarters? No, there's no. Not really. No. It's just part. Of, it's just a voluntary participation of people. I mean, I'm, uh, I've not been paid for being here today. It's, it's not really, yeah, we try and keep the money out of it as much as possible for obvious reasons. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's the general nature. The local chapters physically do they exist in a Yes, they do. Um, all chapters around the world have regular chapter meetings. Um, in London, the London chapter, we have, we, up until recently, we had like regular monthly meetings. Since the Occupy movement has actually suddenly burgeoned and blossomed, we've taken a break from that because we really wanted to try and feed into that, find out where people were actually heading with the Occupy movement, because there was lots of issues around sort of recognising that the financial system is clearly flawed, but not posing any sort of solutions to it. But generally speaking, yes, we do actually have regular monthly meetings. In fact, I'm as the one of the coordinators for the London chapter, I'm just in the process of actually setting up the next one for later this month. <coughs> Um, when you talk about um, scientific resources to improve the system, uh, what do you mean exactly by scientific resources, especially in use? Is it more uh, in terms of anthropology and um, social uh, studies, analyze, analyzing how we work, or what do you mean by that? Uh, all areas of scientific um, uh, you know, inquiry, basically. Anything that's, you know, relevant to the social system, which in turn ends up being pretty much just the list you've noted. Anything within science. As I mentioned, it's uh, sciences um, it, uh, arrives at decisions. Um, it, it doesn't really matter what your opinion is. You know, people say you're entitled to your opinion, but um, you're only entitled to it if you've, you know, done some research and you've actually brought back some, some evidence, you know, to the table. Um, if, if that makes sense, and often people sort of cherish, you know, their opinions <coughs> when if you really delve down into them, they probably just read them on the front page of the newspaper, and that's that. It's not really that's not really valid context by which to make your opinions made. So we have this wonderful decision-making method that's brought us to this room with cameras and screens and laptops and clothes and chairs and everything else, and we've applied it to the profit-making mechanism that we had in place. It's this sort of out, now outdated and archaic. We've never applied it to human and social imperatives, human and social needs. And it's the best tool we have for making, arriving at the most sensible decisions rather than relying on politicians to make them for us. So we feel that this is a far better um, uh, uh, way to uh, arrive at a more appropriate set of decisions. Is that, is that fair or did you um, start doing any of that? Do you have an example of how you used your resources, to, apart from the meeting, of course? Did you have any other examples? Of I'll, give you a good, I'll give you a pretty, pretty good example of arriving at a decision um, in terms of uh, this method as opposed to the method we're probably all used to. Uh, this is it's one of my, one of my favourites. If you've got <coughs> a square plot of land with um, four families living on it, one in each corner, and you decide to plant a fruit tree because you want some fruit. So you got you can plant it in any one of the corners or in the middle. Where do you plant it? Any any takers? Yeah, yeah, everybody goes in the middle, of course, yeah. But actually, the scientific method says, well, no, you need to measure the pH level of the soil. You need to think about irrigation. You need to think about sunlight. You need to think about the nutrients. There's a lot more to you know to take into account before you just say. The middle, you know, if, if it's made of chalk or, you know, or the ground's not fertile or it's not, you know, 
not exposed in the right way and all of these sorts of different things, you're not going to get a high yield of fruit. That's not a very sensible approach to take. So instantly you can see how your culture, and my first reaction was the bit, you know, your culture has made you think the middle. But actually science says, no, no, not the middle actually, just like the world isn't flat. That's, you know, so uh, hopefully that's, uh, that's an idea. And obviously we, we need to uh, look towards long term rebuilding our social model out of this scarcity orientated one into an abundance one that's efficient rather than you know, uh, what we have today. Just one more example I'd, I'd like to just make there is what does everyone think the fastest way to travel long distances on this planet? Now some of you might know our sci-fi material so you're not allowed to comment. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Any takers? Aeroplanes. Aeroplanes. Yeah, so that's what I thought. Sorry? No, not true. Maglev technology, maglev train technology. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that's basically a, um, a train suspended on a, a pole, basically, um, with, with magnets, so that there's no friction on or around the pole. And if you um, currently, we have these actually operating in Germany, I believe, in a couple of other countries, and they can go <coughs> in excess of 500 miles an hour. But if you were to put them in an airtight, closed, frictionless tube, uh, so you, you limit the, the air friction in that tube, and we can uh, conservatively get up to three and a half thousand miles an hour. And, and it, so it dwarf it. Uh, air, air. I mean, that's obviously long distance, you know, future stuff. The real question you've always got to ask yourself is, do we have the resources and the know-how to do that? And the answer is yes. Do we have the money? No. It's actually still technically through the air. Yeah, got me. <laughs> no, no, I'm not no, you're getting you, but I thought, how on earth, how on earth can you get the train to get 4,000 miles an hour? It's got to be through the air. Well, it, friction. Yeah, it's, it's limiting friction, so yeah, it's, it's, it, is, it is through the air. But, but you, I'm, I'm just using the example that obviously commercial flight uses up a hell of a load of non-renewable, dirty fuel. Yeah, to travel at a far less efficient rate and, oh by the way, that technology as well, here's an extra clicker, the energy it takes to run that is, I think, 2%, well, right, 2% of that of airplane travel, 98% more energy efficient and hundreds and hundreds of miles, thousands of miles an hour, in fact, faster. Us versus the monetary system, we win here. <laughs> um. You were talking about the trains there, and that makes me think of the, the video that's on the, the internet, the moving forward one, where it talks about circular cities and things like mm -hmm. that. So I wasn't sure when I saw it whether you meant that as a, a hypothetical ideal or actually something that you really want to move towards. If it is something you really want to move towards, do you have any ideas about what it looks like between now and what? How our life on the planet looks like between now and that point. Um, so, uh, you say between now and when we when we get to that point, yeah, the transition. Between, now and this this this, uh, this ideal that, that's on the dome, right. uh, the circular cities. Yeah. I'm assuming we're not going to just bulldoze all the cities that we've got now and just replace them with so it's not going to happen in one go. So how, what's the kind of um, steps between here and there, you okay. see? Okay, um, I could expand on this. Uh, you're talking about a transition, essentially. Uh, that question is inevitable, isn't it, really? It comes up in every uh, Q&A. And what we usually uh, talk about is three, the three phases. We're in phase one, which is community, communicating with the public. Uh, we need to go down all avenues to do so and collecting people and, and spreading this message out there. Uh, phase two is when we become more uh, dynamic, we become project orientated. We get into larger projects to spread this information more and hopefully get um, build bridges with other groups as well, larger groups. And, uh, and then in phase three, then we become a lot more um, action orientated. We get involved with uh, companies that are hopefully, uh, you know, put some money towards uh, building like a, like a, well, a resource uh, city, a, re a research centre, uh, which we call test city sometimes, but we would like to build a city 
potentially somewhere uh, that would be more um, be more prone to do something like that and, and to show the world what is possible. You know, if we, we actually built a city which was and we invited all leaders from all over the world and actually showed what is actually possible. Look how sustainable this is. Look how all the parameters are self-evident. You see, and and that's uh, that's just a brief uh, summary of what, of what we the transition would be. More or less, but as you were saying before the, about um, resources, we would actually bulldoze a lot of cities down <coughs> for mining, but uh, cities and cities like New York, London, Paris, we could actually keep them as museum cities, so we can show the people uh, how we used to live and so on. So we would take up, take down a lot of the towns and cities. Um, I think well, it's, sorry. sorry, yeah, I mean, that, that's, <coughs> that's eventual. Not remembering that we've got vast tracts of land, you know, available to us. We haven't even started to populate the oceans yet. So we, we, don't, we don't really have that issue, per, per se, to deal with for quite some time. Especially when we're using resources more conservatively, we're using energy more conservatively, when we're, when we're geared towards going in this direction. It will be far, far easier, and, and we, we wish to make things uh, more uh, irrelevant over time. So, to, you know, once, if, if you wanted to move into a city, because you see that the standard of living is just infinitely better um, for you, your friends, your family, whatever it may be, um, you grew this direction, maybe you did, the, you know, the idea of harvesting your old brick house for resources really isn't the problem too much. You know, that, that, but that is just so far in the future that right now, this is the problem with the transition, the big, big problem with it is that people want to know, well, what's all the steps to get in there? And the answer is, we don't know. We need to do this together. It's a human project and, and, and it, need, it needs all of our participation and all of our will eventually if it's going to succeed. Part of that is proving it for a test city. But ultimately, the real conundrum you have to face in transition is this. Just because it's difficult to get from point A to point B doesn't result in the need to do so. If you're in your house and you've run out of food and your cars break down, the buses aren't running and there's no other way of getting to the shop and it's five miles away, you're walking. You don't have the luxury of saying, well, I'll just starve. You're not going to starve, you're going to walk. You know, we, those problems we denoted aren't going away. So ultimately, it's a case of saying, it's going to be tough, it's going to be the toughest, one of the toughest, if not the toughest, transition in, in humanity's history to do. It doesn't stop it being necessary. So I think that's that's the first hurdle you've got to, got to get past. Um, and then you know once we're once we're there, then we can build from from that place. Does that help answer? It's such a difficult topic to. It's such a difficult question to answer because, the, as I said, the first transition has to happen with you. It has to happen with your frame of reference, with your consciousness. If you, if you think this is a sensible notion and, and you can see the science behind it and it's provable that it can be done, then the rest will build itself up self evidently with your participation. Can I just, um, sorry, can I just expand on that? Um, there's two types of transition. There's a technical transition, um, which we know we've got the technology to do it with, but there's the cultural transition, which is uh, our plate and, you know, the current values which basically support uh, life substance, uh, what, what gives us uh, our energy, our food, and everything that's, that supports us. And that, that would be, uh, in, you know, it would be a tra within the transition period. But, you know, we'd have to get, to get companies and groups and all these people on board. They have to feel a benefit for, um, have to feel the benefit for actually doing something like this, you know. And as uh, James pointed out, it's going to take quite a social pressures. It's going to people are only going to act until they don't get their food on the table, until they can't afford a roof over their head. That's what, that's at the point when they think, okay, I'm actually going to start questioning what this is all about. Thank you for coming board. Um. As a movement, I am supporting the application of the public tax. I mean, uh, can you go in your direction, like a, a first big step, because <coughs> the distribution of the richness that is made by the finance, 
Yes, you know, uh, obviously the theft that is going on, you know, 23 trillion to people who essentially caused, you know, caused the, the problems and they got paid off for doing it is, is, is why you're seeing all these movements around the world, probably why a lot of you are here tonight, is this because they're, they're about to take our life support system away so that they can feed their sort of cancerous death model. But it doesn't, whilst in abstract, it's nice. My fear is this, my personal fear is that they'll, they'll go, please give us a 2% tax on derivatives, please, we'll be so grateful. Okay, think on, here you go, go on, off you go. That's not going to solve the problem, it isn't. As, as we denoted in there, the internal logic of this system is going to collapse. It's unavoidable. And a 2% tax on derivatives is, is uh, like you know, having a 50-year-old mug that is rusting and everything, and you just polish the window. Hope that it's, everything's going to be sorted. It's not. It's still going to break down. And that's so essentially, that's what my fear is: is that people will go, "Oh, I'm well, the government's nice. It's not going to solve. It's not going to solve fractional reserve banking. It's not going to solve the debt problem. It's not going to solve the interest problem. It's not going to solve ecological balance. It's not going to solve technological unemployment. It's not going to solve planned obsolescence. It's not going to solve intrinsic obsolescence. It's not going to solve the profit motive. It's not going to solve self orientation or selfishness or greed or lies or anything else. That this system is based on. Uh, it's on um, how you use the money. If you use the money properly, someone check that. That's what we try. I, I agree. You know, in a sense, we actually need to use this system to bridge to the next one. I don't want it to collapse. But I fear what they've said is right. Yeah. Unfortunately, I fear that biosocial pressures will be needed, which is, um, again, what's to said what we, why we're here, why the Occupy movements are here, and why we have a presence at all of these Occupy movements around the world, because we want to communicate to people that if they just ask for scraps, scraps is all they'll get. In the, mean, in the bridge time, I do agree with you, it would, it would be great to get some more money fed back into the people, you know, rather than the 1%. But remember how this system is structured, 1% of the world controls 40% of the world's wealth. That's not an accident, that's a design. This system is designed to funnel wealth up to the top. That's why 1 billion people on this planet are starving. 50% live on less than $2 a day and 80 on less than 10 that is, that is not an accident. That is designed intrinsically into the system. And so that, I do, like I say, yes, we agree in abstract, but it, we, we need to, you know, wedge all of that in there and drop it down. Because if people don't understand the root causes of the problems, they will continue to persist. Yeah, but you can do it in parallel. I mean, you start to spread your little thinking. In the meantime, you just want to break everything down, use the money to change it. You know? That money alone won't be enough. It's a lot of money. But it's still the, the, nowhere the, near the, enough. The money, the money we the drop in the ocean. Yeah, the money we would need to implement this doesn't exist. That's the problem. You you will never have enough money for a resource based economy. The, the two are diametrically opposed. You you can't have a monetary <laughs> system uh, based on competition, self interest, um, and the uh, and human labour, essentially. Um, and to have a resource-based economy. It's, it's not possible to create abundance. Because think of it like this, if everyone had an orange tree, right? If everyone had an orange tree at the end of their garden, Sainsbury's wouldn't sell any oranges. You can't have abundance in the system. It's built on scarcity. Scarcity is built into the monetary system itself. It's through the interest and the cycle of loans because the monetary system has to be scarce because if money just fell out the sky, people would go and pick it up, but if it kept falling, they'd sweep it up because it's, it's then abundant. So we need to get to, if you want to go to an abundant system, you literally can't have money. It's not possible. So in the meantime, the, the money you're talking about, yes, it could be used for more social, socially imperative to, you know, direction. I agree, and it would be great to funnel it back in and use it to move in this direction. But, it, but people, if they understand this direction, then it, we could use it in really sensible ways. Well, I'm just, uh, you need the money for your money. Yeah, you the money. 
Sorry? Practically, I came and gave you this, a world of free of money. Yeah. I, I, I came and gave you this. Already, a huge proportion of the world's population has very little money anyway. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. There's not a very little money, but anyway, that the world is based on money. So you can't change it, you, must, you, can't, you can't do it, the world of free of money. So I think well, you need to change it, it's more steps. Yes, it's more steps, yes. Don't you think that the, the transition will require some, some of what's familiar now, I, a little bit more political will to change things positively, and a little bit monetary reform initially, you know? Because it, coming from what we know now into a resource-based economy would be like giving young mummy Indians a space shuttle and asking them to do something with it. And they wouldn't have any clue what to do with it. So, you know, it's like my kids have grown up used to computers completely. I had to learn how to use computers. Yeah? But then it's been completely natural for them to use it. It's kind of asking, asking what, like, when did you start using the internet? How many, what day did you start? Nobody here can really probably remember that. But we're so used to it now. It's just become a natural part of our life. How, how, how much do you think that can play a part in the future now with politics and, and monetary reform? How important is that for people to be willing to go along with a change with things that they're familiar with slowly? I think that, uh, basically, I think that's been, uh, a very, very good point. I think the testity is important. It's again another part of the transition of getting used to it. Like this is a very good point Tom's raised. This is this is critical. You're not gonna wake up tomorrow, everybody just, you know, has a sudden raise of consciousness and we all jump into a resource based economy. That would actually be terrible and it wouldn't work because yeah, if you took someone from a completely different culture and dumped them in our culture, they wouldn't know how to survive and vice versa. So there does have to be transition to transitionary steps. And ultimately, if we could use the monetary system, in a sense, um, to gear towards this and, and raise the political consciousness and awareness and all of these different fields towards this direction, we will start to use our tools a lot more intelligently and hopefully go towards it in a more peaceful manner. That's what I would love to see. But um, ultimately, we, we have to move in this uh, direction, so however that happens in, in, uh, in great. So I hope that addresses your point. Uh, in terms of the world free of money, sorry, uh, please come back to the technological unemployment. It's not going away. So human labour for, re for jobs and resources. It, technology to displacing human labour means that people being put out of work by the technology don't have the purchase power to buy the goods anymore. So money's going. It doesn't really matter what. This is the point. I know that's hard to uh, to get your head around, but there are human civilizations who live on this planet who've never had money, who've never had war, who've never had these problems. You know, in a, there's the Anuta, the Binuet. There are there are these human civilizations that manage to do it. It's an artificial mode of exchange. Um, it, it doesn't have to be. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. We, we transition to something else with the best species that we know of is adapting and we need to adapt. So we'll either adapt or we it, it, I would encourage you to watch some of our materials because it is a big concept to take on board. Um, I, I want to get onto some other questions, but I would definitely encourage you to, to take a look at that issue in a lot because uh, it is a bit of a curveball. Yeah. Uh, one thing you said to the test, is it test? Test it. You can buy beans. Yes. Which beans? Um, and it's one of your beans. I thought it wanted to get. Yeah, I'm not being facetious. No, 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 no. I know it's chicken and egg and what happened. Who knows? It's not living on this whole thing. No, not us as leaders. We, just, we have leaders now. Sorry, the leaders of people. The leaders of countries. <coughs> Politicians. Politician. Present political, yeah. finance leaders. Yeah. Yes, those presidents. Particularly political. At the end of the day, you're creating. You're, create, you're creating a test, experimental, university, city, whatever name you want to give that, but you're actually still, you're still creating it within the present system. Therefore, you have to encourage people who think of themselves as leaders, if that's the case at that particular time, to come and see how things can be done differently. 
it could be difficult simply because if you're a politician and you're going into something like a resource-based economic model, the <coughs> essentially your job will probably become obsolete together with a number of other. If we, if we have our tests, this is the ground roots up. Yeah. Exactly. Better to have the test sitting. Yeah. More comes. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. No, just forget. Well, That's the like you start to happen, and then the pressure like, will come the, the pressure, the idea, or the possible implementation of the testing would even start to happen unless the people at the top got pressure from the people below you to actually go through the process of examining the viability of the testing. The testing that was in moving forward, or that Jack drew up in these futuristic cities, are effectively an example of working towards a design. That was a, a, yeah. a suggestion of a design the of, an, of, a, of, a, of a hyper efficient city. Now, you don't really know what's going to work and what isn't going to work until you put it, in, you put it into practice and you apply the science of the to it. So it's, that is really, it was just an idea and something that's on the drawing board. Yeah. You don't know what's going to work and what isn't going to work until you put it into action. It's a catch-22. You've got all this people something and then they give them all sorts of reasons to I think when people start to see they're not getting enough of their needs met within the existing system, and they're starting to they as they become more and more aware and look at the bigger picture and say, you know what, the route we're going, where we've come in the last 50 years, where, where are we going to be 50 years from now? It's not looking great. Maybe we need to be looking at this. Yeah. And, and I would just echo that by saying politics is a short term operation. You know, it runs for four years. As yeah. long as they get past the next four years and get your votes, they're happy bunnies. You know, and, and as long as they find the, the pockets of their corporate, you know, uh, bunnies and, and everybody else and Rupert Murdoch and all the rest of them, then it's uh, it's business as usual. And we can't afford to do business as usual. But not if we want our children and the future of our species to continue on this planet in a sustainable and humane fashion. And that is the bottom line. Yeah, and so. If a leader wanted to come along, fine. People want to come along, fine. I agree with you, it's a grassroots up thing, and eventually I'll get away from having leaders. I don't want leaders. I do all right. I'll do all right on my own if there's a collective will to move towards actually strategic management and efficiency, you know, and a combined effort to move towards a sustainable social system that's humane. But it's almost it's... beyond human concept. <laughs> Sorry? It is almost beyond human it's beyond our concepts and it's if you talk to someone in Roman times and say, do you know what, I think these Romans stink. Romans are going to be around for a million years. Well, they're not. That was slavery, you know? That changed in one man's lifetime because of one, one, one man kicking ass. This is, this is 500,000 people kicking ass. And we're right. At least I think we are. Uh, so, so do you, you know what I mean? We just, we need more people, we need, we need more people who take the time to understand this, this direction and um, we're moving it. The transition is going to happen however it happens. It will, it will, unfortunately, I fear it's going to be messy. I hate to say that. I don't want to say that. I don't want it to be messy. It's the last thing I want, which is why I put so much effort into this. Uh, does the movement um, organise or think or begin to think about uh, organising and uh, skill pools so that we can stop working for money. My, I mean, my understanding is that we, I think David was talking about the second phase of the movement's sort of trajectory, if you want to call it that, of its, its, its aims and its goals. Part of that is actually creating those types of projects. Um, there are people in the UK and in other countries at the moment who are getting together to try and build sort of simple, I mean, one particular case in the States, a more complex version of like a, a hydroponics um, centre. Um, there are people who are beginning to collaborate on trying to improve on other parts of technology. For example, there's a technology called evacuated tube transportation, which is the 4,000 mile an hour sort of magnet technology brought to its conclusion. Um, there are people currently wanting to actually join with ETT, which is a company that actually is trying to make this happen. 
to actually say to them, well, you know, you've got this form of technology, we've got the social system in which it could best be used. Um, so that's one perspective. Um, so yes, there are there is gradual <coughs> building of skill pools, skill sets, um, trying to get positive, concrete versions of what we're talking about out there, so that people can actually observe them in action. I would just add to that and say that the skill pool thing is happening irrespective of farmers. You, you've got the internet. The internet is doing that at the moment. I mean, I'm in, I'm in a local. Uh, trade scheme, you know, where I live, uh, which the internet facilitates. Um, so, um, and, and the internet obviously facilitates this movement, it has facilitated this movement, it's facilitated um, showing you things the mainstream media don't show you, you know, so that you can see that they're, you know, they're covering up certain information a, a lot of the time. So. The, the internet's been really, really good for this, and I think it could be a great vehicle for social change. And ultimately, that's another way, coming back to your point, sir, about the, um, the making of the monetary system obsolete. Technology does, does that, you know, it makes old systems irrelevant. People don't see that, they think social change just happens through people, you know, getting up in their soapbox and telling everybody that we need to change, but actually technology does a fantastic job of changing society all by itself in many, many different ways. One example would be um, in New York, they used to have a really big problem with horse crime, basically. Horses that went through there, it was a big issue. They voted politicians in, they discussed it, they talked about it. The only time they really got that problem solved is with a motor car. They just disappeared. They need to vote. Are politicians? Fair enough? And that's what we're looking to do, is to utilise more uh, to make social problems irrelevant. Yeah. And the internet is helping, I think, in that, in what you said, and in many, many other ways, and many other technologies as well. That are so you get shut down. Sorry. One of the um, targets of our council is a little bit of the show. He wants to venture things through um, like, you know, some of the future activities. One of the things that we're going to argue is we're going to start to protect the system. Well, that might be a podcast. We're not really investing that. To be creative in terms of to be creative, um, you know, with, with technology and with certain ones that you know, I have, and you've got some good things that they do, and you can do it to the capitalists and the criminals, and the rich brands, and the rules you mentioned through money, basically. Um, you know, it's just money that gets all the schemes, well. Uh, they do because they get a real buzz out of what they do. I know, I couldn't have to do that. I'd like to have a stand that. In fact, if you do more in uh, innovation and, and creative um, uh, endeavours and designs are actually more prevalent in more equal societies. That you can find that information from a book called the Spirit Hell. I strongly recommend you uh, read that book because uh, it's a very, very good case for how more equal societies have less social problems. But interestingly, that creativity one is very, very interesting, isn't it? Because like you said, you need to think in a more socially stratified um, society where, you know, if you go out and you invent and design, you know, that, that people would be more incentivized to be like that. But in fact, it doesn't work that way. In fact, if you look at most of the best designs and movements forward in creative technologies and applications, it would come from a monetary incentive. But actually, when you look at it historically, that's not the case. Take someone like Nikola Tesla. I was using this as a fantastic example. Uh, he's the reason you've got mobile you know, phone technology and radio largely and, um, and things like that. Now, he wanted to build an, uh, a tower called Wardenclyffe Tower, which pulled in energy from the ionosphere and give free energy, wireless energy to the world. Um, and he was going up against Edison at the time with these two competing power sources. And the people they were both being bankrolled was J.P. Morgan. They were being, both being bankrolled by J.P. Morgan. And they walked into his office and Edison said this, you know, I can run this system on oil and wires and whatever. And he said, okay. Uh, Tesla said, I can give free energy to the world. And J.P. Morgan went, how are we going to sell that? Well, we're not going to sell it. And he went, oh, interesting. So yeah, and he cut off Tesla's supply and Tesla died alone in a New York hotel apartment room at 18 broke with no money. And he was possibly the, one of the greatest scientific minds and inventors. Who would have been better than Edison? Sorry? Who would have been better than Edison? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, so, and, 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 and he didn't do that app for, for monetary gain. Einstein didn't come up with the theory of relativity because he got panned a few more quick. 
Do you know what I mean? Um, a, a musician doesn't necessarily write a better riff when he goes, Do you know what? This riff isn't working out, man. Can you just throw me another tenor? Oh, that is it. Now, now, all <laughs> the smoke on the wall, baby. Do you know what I mean? That doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Do, do you see what I mean? Okay. It, it do, but there's other people like Jobs, um, yeah. for example, that have a little Louis didn't bend them, and you can help with these guys pull that together. Mm. I don't think that my like, <laughs> neurons at that point in his brain that fired to create whatever he needed to create happened because he saw another dollar bill. I don't see I don't see the connection. I'm a mus- uh, I'm, I'm a musician, so I can only talk from my perspective in that area of creativity. I cannot name a single time that I've been paid for coming up with a piece of music and it was in- intrinsically better than when I wasn't paid for. I always want to create the best piece of music I can. Um, I, I think that's a natural human thing. You know, a kid playing with a toy, it doesn't, it, or trying to, you know, build a sandcastle, doesn't build a better sandcastle just because you paint it. In fact, um, I'm sorry, one more study I want to bring into this is this, quite good, because this one's done by the Federal Reserve, so I love this one. Okay? They tried to run this five times to get a different result, and they didn't get it, where they basically paid people for uh, laborious tasks that involve sort of manual labour. Um, and creative tasks, and they pay them initially to see their output, and then they up the pay to see their output. And in the creative tasks, creativity actually diminished when they paid them more. Um, and in the later tasks, productivity went up when they paid them more. So if you want to break your back, you know, and do some hard work, someone pays you some more, it's not a problem. You work, you work harder. But with creativity, it actually diminishes, which is which is where the so the equal, the more equal societies come in, where actually ingenuity is better in those social systems because you it, it's just the freedom to be creative and think creatively rather than a uh, profit back breaking way. And they ran they ran it five times. They ran it in India where they upped the stakes massively and like you know really inflated the game and they got exactly the same results. And they didn't want it. I was just going to expand on that. I'm actually creating a lecture at the moment on incentive and motivation. And uh, are you familiar with Daniel Pink and Alfie Cohn? No. no? Right, well, uh, they've done uh, tremendous research into many studies over the last 60 years, 70, 60, 70 years. And uh, it's amazing the amount of uh, research they go up. They, they worked out that rewards can only give you two things, and that's short term compliance. And, and it's good for algorithmic work, you know, following a certain set of instructions to get a specific goal. That is it. It actually lowers interest, performance, creativity, it promotes unethical behavior, it creates short, uh, more like to say shortcuts. And uh, for one little example on creativity, um, there was a, uh, an experiment uh, called the uh, Kendall problem. And um, they, there was two groups who wanted who was going to go and solve this candle problem. There was a candle, uh, a box of port, um, drawing pins, and some matches. Uh, the idea was to actually put the candle on the wall without it dripping on the table below. Um, the, they were going to pay one group to do um, see them how long it take to solve the task, and they were going to pay. They weren't going to pay the other group. They were just doing it. And apparently the ones that got paid actually took three and a half minutes longer. Uh, and this has actually been replicated a lot, lot of times, replicated so many times. Hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah hundreds of times, times actually. And that's just one example. There's actually loads of uh, studies and experiments that show this very example. Even with kids drawing in classrooms, uh, Kids that promised the reward, they're actually going to take less interest in what they're doing. We'll tell them more efficient sex because they're used to be doing the same cuts in the application sex, which is something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The interesting yeah. thing yeah. as well about sort of the about in, sort of inventing this in the monetary system is that if the monetary system is actually so good at actually creating, sort of, uh, encouraging creativity, inventiveness, um, why aren't there Einstein's around every corner? <coughs> why aren't there jobs around every corner? I mean, at the end of the day, money is, is, the system, is the system that we use to organise society. If it really is that good at actually doing that, they're, they're, I mean, there's no reason for people all over the place to actually be, be becoming creative, inventive, and, but I don't see that. I mean, I see occasional people, but... There's a great book by Daniel Penn called Drive. Mm. It's really worth reading. 
it really, that, that, that's all propaganda, all that stuff about, you know, capitalism causing, you know, incentive and creativity, that's just propaganda, complete and utter propaganda. Well, there's a lot of scope as well, um, while working to create um, <clears throat> a consciousness shift, a shift of values um, from materialism to and uh, self-interest to sharing and um, you can uh, think of loads of different ways in how to promote um, the ideas you've heard tonight. Um, we've, had, we've got a, um, a Why I Advocate uh, campaign um, from the, uh, <coughs> and uh, lots of um, people have contributed to that with their own particular uh, expression creatively on why I advocate the zeitgeist movement, why, why I want to resource space economy. And you get a lot of movie makers now on um, computers and camcorders are coming down in price. Is it the, you know, how to effectively engage with the public to inspire them to, because there's a lot of negativity about it, there's a lot of pessimism about it, and there's a lot of, um, because we're in this elitist type of divided, you know, the haves and the have-nots and the status differentials, a lot of people feel powerless. But when, you know, at the end of the day, where have all the experts got us? You know, they're not really experts. Societies are digital, and we've got the ability and potential to create. This is the most creative thing you can do to create a new world society of unity with strategic resource management and allocation, treating the earth as the single entity it is. And things could be very different, but we want them to play our part. I guess that one of the things that I is most appealing to me about Zeitgeist Movement is its lack of involvement in the mainstream politics of the system that it regards as a purpose to attack as being fair. I just wonder, it's a very unfair question because I don't suppose there's way you can answer it, but I wonder if you foresee dangers in the future that as the movement grows. Um, it inevitably, you know, it's one thing being asked a question here, should we have the Robin Hood tax? Sooner or later, one of you guys is going to be on TV, on question time or whatever, being asked that question. And are you going to be drawn into having opinions, having views in the short-term politics of the day? Um, and are you going to be corrupted by that? Because, you know, whereas I know none of you feel you are at the moment, history's not, not good on that. I would say this <coughs> This is a, a leadless thing, um, our, our movement. Uh, yes, we, have to, we, we do have to have representatives um, go and articulate these ideas with the mainstream and mainstream tactics. You've got that spot on, you know. They definitely try and twist your words and, you know, quickly put you in a box and throw you out the window. Because you're either going to say yes, we should. Exactly. Or you're going to say no. Is that, that, you know, that's, that's, the idea. that's what they want, isn't it? Yeah. They're, they're, are, you gonna, are you either going to vote or you're not going to vote? You're either this or you're that. You're either right wing or left wing. You're either this or that. And they want to stick you in a box and go, good, he's a communist. Oh, good, he's a fascist. But right, see ya. So that you're just, you're passed away. Oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. And they want do you know, you know, and, and they're going to do this. This is a, it's a very good question, actually. Because this is a massive part of what we are going to have to come to expect if you really actually understand this direction. We, we are going to be attacked. We're going to be vilified. We're going to be it's, it's, already, it's already happened. It's all, I can give you. I can give you several examples of where you know uh, we, we've been, been attacked, uh, you know, in one way or another. Um, uh, uh, but basically, you just what you can do. Oh, you know, they they try, they called me a name. <laughs> you know, it doesn't it doesn't change what we need to do. For me, the, the thing that I, I I'm most fearful about and most fearful of is not that you're going to be attacked, but that sooner or later. David Cameron, Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, whoever it is going to be, is going to say, who joined the cabinet? 
And it's going to be very, very difficult. Can I be in the Can I go in? Can I go in the way it's tight? Yeah, I've got to actually do it if I can do that. But you know, there's, there's almost a bigger danger that you'll be seduced into playing your part in the mainstream political system. There's, there no, is, there's no leadership, there's no, that's a there's no boardroom. And, that's a you know, London is separate to Manchester, it's separate to Berlin, it's separate to France, it's separate to Turkey. It's not, it's not one oracle that's right. then funneling the message down to everybody else. Yeah. That's not what it's about. Um, so if one person gets invited to join another thing, Mr. Cameron's coming back. That's his deal. That doesn't mean the whole, the whole, you know, the whole theory, the whole idea, the ethos and the ideas we're talking about. So, uh, and, yeah, so if, if we, we did end up, you know, in that situation, it wouldn't really manifest into anything. If we, the only thing it, I could see it possibly manifesting into is, um, is a resource-based economy, because this is critical. This is based on um, critical thinking skills, um, you know, and education, ultimately. Um, if, if people are aware of this direction, and one of our, and, and past, like, lots of people are aware of this direction in which we can head, and they've got a pretty good uh, scope and understanding of it, of it. And one of us does get invited to the political spectrum. If we turn around and say, well, growth figures don't look good this week, guys, you're all going to go, Growth figures don't growth. Well, infinite growth, yeah? How many people do you hear talk about that whenever someone says GDP in the Houses of Parliament? No one says, oh, you want to grow infinitely on a finite planet. No one does that. Because, so that's what I mean, is that even if I do get invited and they go, just go out there and talk about growth. Oh, Jesus. You know what I mean? And you go, I go out there and I say it, all you guys are going to go, and you wouldn't vote for me anyway. So that's what I mean, is that ultimately it's a consciousness shift, which is what I remember saying, is that it has to, that's what we like about being grassroots and talking to actual people and hopefully they understand this direction, rather than, like I said earlier, that we put it across and across, it's just not going Also, at the moment, the conversation is so you know, We live in society, the dialogue, it, it's, it's, it's so not, that's it. So any, you, 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 let's say hypothetically we're talking about question time next week. There, the conversation will be within the, the parameters that are already predefined. And what's the point? We're talking about something completely different, utterly different, a new way of thinking, a completely radical way of thinking that doesn't fit within the existing box. We're talking about redesigning the box. Let's come up with a new box. Who said that this is the only box we can ever live in? That's really what it means. And so yet people thinking about that and saying, like, oh, we've been, we've been indoctrinated, who told us that we've grown up in this, that it can only be this way. And that one political party, well, we're not so good on this, but we're better on this, or someone else is going to be your savior on this, or whatever. Come on. You know, you, if you've been around enough, you have to live under a rock, and you've seen what's going on, it ain't changing. It's just rearranging the chair. So we have to change the conversation. We have to be able to stop thinking, how to start thinking outside the, the main conversation, which is completely controlled right now. And that's really the main of what we're trying to say. I, I just echo, echo that. Um, look at technological unemployment. I, I, I always come back to this because it's it, it, because the thing about technological unemployment, literally every time I bring that up, people quickly change the conversation if they don't agree with me. Oh, they get the hell out of there quick because they've got no argument. And that's the point. And with such a cataclysmic trend, when you look, especially when you look at the figures of this, why is it not in your newspapers? Why? It's because they don't have a social interest, they have a profit interest. They have an interest inside the box, which is what Jermaine's saying. If, if there was a true debate going on about humanity, about where we're going as a species, where we're going as a direction, I'll tell you what, technological unemployment would be on the front pages of all your newspapers tomorrow. And if it's not on there tomorrow, I'll tell you what, if we wake up tomorrow morning and it's on there, your system works. I'll have a bet with you. How about that? I'll bet you in my house that it's not on there. There you go. It won't be on your, and if it's not on the front pages as an issue that we need to face as a species, this system is flawed. It's got to be, because it's a massive threat to your, your system, and the, the papers propagate where there are problems in the world and talk about them and report them, right? So surely they've got them, right? Okay, we'll see. 
And then, the evidence is there. <laughs> There's so much evidence towards this. It's just not in the mainstream conversation at all. Don't take our word for it. Look it up. Extraordinary evidence for this. Coming down the pipeline. It's one of the problems with the level of youth unemployment now in parts of the Middle East is, is staggering. It's almost 50%. And that's not changing. They think this is one of the reasons why there's been so much help people. There's no, they have no future in this There's nothing coming down the pipeline for them. And that is starting to be, when we talk about these things, some of the things that we're talking about today will start to, they'll come back to you as you start to read your newspapers. And you'll, you'll see a, 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 an article about the number, there was one last week about the number of um, youth unemployment in this country. But the, and you'll start to see that there's the little bits talked about, but the, no one actually goes in and, and explains the whole of the bigger picture on it. Um, but it is there. Academics talk about it, the figures are there, um, non mainstream economists talk about it, it the information is there, but it's just not delivered to you or anyone. Okay. If you were to identify the single biggest uh, real world success story of this movement, what would you identify as the biggest real world success story of this movement so far? Oh, oh yeah. Um, the films have been viewed by 100 million people. Right. But so that's kind of a big deal. But in terms of the difference that just brought about in real people's lives. Yeah, um, yeah I'd, I'd say I'd echo that actually the films are quite important because it has actually brought the numbers in. It's, as you could probably guess, it, it, is, it has been the most effective way, effective medium we've used actually to um, bring people in and spread the, the information out there. So obviously the films are a big part, but obviously we're going to try and use all methods, all mediums to try and get this information out there. <coughs> yeah, I just wanted to say, because you're talking about like tangible effects on people's life that's the inside the movement. I, um, this is just one example. I'm sure there's many. We're, we're quite a large movement, so I certainly can't you know, pick everything up. But um, uh, NASA engine, uh, space engineer, who basically is a prominent member of the movement called Douglas Millet, uh, is actually starting up a hydroponics food farming facility, which is, uh, if, you, uh, if you're not familiar with hydroponics, just briefly, it's the growing of plants in organically nutrient-rich water, which if you house them in a cylindrical tube and you, you um, turn them, it only fights against gravity half of its lifespan. So it, you're tricking the plant to grow to sometimes two-thirds its original size. Now, if you house all this in a 12-storey, one-acre floor space automated, um, robotic f facility, food farming facility, um, you will produce as much agricultural yield as 400 acres of farming land. Farming land, by the way, that we're depleting at, at, at an alarming rate due to the turnover of the topsoil and the use of pesticides and all sorts of other um, things that we're, do we're doing to turn over a profit more quickly. When we've got that technology sitting right there and Douglas is starting up company, at least in this system, that of course has to make a profit to a degree, but eventually he wants to show the possibility of that and give away some, some food for free. But we're under no illusion is that, that, that to the degree to which we, the, the sort of patchwork which you can do in the system, which is what I said about the charities, you know, charities and organisations, they, they mean well. That's why they, you've got this rainbow of them across the horizon. Because everybody's like fanning over this problem, going, Jesus, things are really, really bad. We need to solve this problem and that problem and that problem and that problem. And that. If the rainbow actually converged and went, whoa, what's that? Down there, you know, and, so, and looked at the root cause of the problem, we, we would get to where we need to get to probably a downside when you're in a hell of a lot more peaceful. And so engaging with those organisations and changing the train of thought is what we're about. I know it's not tangible. It's hard for people go, well, who are you feeding? And it's like, well, I could go and work with one of these organisations, but it's not going to solve the dirty root at the bottom of your culture. It's like, the example I use is society is kind of like, you know, this organic growth, if you want it, it's like a tree. Basically, we have a, we have a rotten root to the, the thing. It's basically like we expect pears to grow on an apple tree. You're not going to have 
a peaceful, sustainable world until you replace that. And it's the train of thought that will do that. You know, people have to understand a direction in a reasonably collective manner eventually and move towards, towards this. So we're all about changing the train of thought at this stage and moving on with more tangible effects in phase two and phase three. No, there are no scale for phase two and three. No. The, the, time scale, the time scale is completely contingent on this. On the world, what happens? And on you. And what, if, if you do nothing, nothing will happen. And you'll, we'll face the consequences together. But I, I don't like the look of those consequences. They are not looking good. You know? I, uh, that's why we're here, you know? We can see there's, there's a lot of in trains, uh, there's a storm on the horizon, and ultimately you're either going to turn your ship in a different direction or face the consequences going into the storm. I know, I know sometimes it's a bit doom and gloom coming into these things, and we tell you, you know, how shit's really, really messed up and really, really bad. And you know, people sort of think, oh, it's a bit doom and gloom. But think about this: papers talk about problems every day. Politicians talk about problems. People go, people go out. You talk to anybody, anybody on the street, and ask them what they think. Oh God, the world shit. You know, and stuff. We're actually saying, yeah, it's really shit. Actually, it's shit for more reasons than you ever comprehended. But look at this solution. Look at what we could be working towards. Not utopia. It's not perfect. It's a damn cycle. Got a better, much better train of thought than what you're you're locked into, um, and so I, I think that's quite uplifting personally. And it's in terms of what it's brought to our lives, my life, it's been a massive uplift because I never had any solution. I just bitched and moaned about this the, the problems in the world with no tangible solutions, and now I've got some bloody decent solutions. I'm going out there and I'm telling everybody about it because I, because we've got to move in this direction. <laughs> There's also a cultural aspect to that. You're, you're fed this doom and gloom crap. Everywhere. I'm less doom and gloom than these guys. So I'm much more positive about it. Um, and there's a brilliant thing on the internet by a group of people called the Admin. And what they did two, I think it was about a year or two ago, they, um, they got the New York Times to publish a copy of the New York Times with nothing but good news on the front page, on the back page. Do you remember this? Yeah, right. And um, it, they filmed the people as they handed out the newspapers. And, People were actually completely overcome. People started crying and hugging each other. And, you know, there was like the war in Iraq was over. Mortgages were gone. You know, uh, there was no more bullshit. <laughs> you know, I mean, and people just were overcome. They, it, they really believed it. And, you know, you, people will believe anything. You know, but it, it just, that whole thing just transcended and just put people in a good mood straight away. And all their inhibitions came down and they realised they were connected. And really, really, really deep down, we all want the best for each other. We really do, you know. Uh, what human being doesn't, other than the psychologically mentally disturbed, you know. You know, we're on this planet together, we've got to live together, you know. This, this guy mentioned here about values, you know. You know, we're seeing evolutionary change in the world. And travel helped me when I was younger. I went to India, I went to Africa. You start to expand. We, you know, we are human. If you believe in the, the, the theory of evolution, we haven't stopped evolving. You know, it didn't stop with growing thumbs, as Bill Hicks said. You know, it's going to carry on. It's going to carry on, and, we, and you know, we've got nowhere else to go. So we might as well try and make a go of it here. You know. And the funny thing is, as well, that in sort of perhaps in a sort of what you use the word tangible, or perhaps we sort of elaborated on that. But it's interesting because part of what I tend to try to get across to people is that. Moneyless forms of doing things, if you want to call them that, actually do this and they're growing. I mean, free cycle is probably the least example of all, where you're, you're talking about a system that doesn't even involve exchange or barter. It doesn't involve that at all. If you have something that you want to give away, you give it away. If somebody needs that thing, they pick it up with no expectation whatsoever that they have to give something in return, nothing at all. And there are other systems, like you've got the free economy website, <coughs> where people offer skills and trades to each other. These things are actually growing. It, you may not, again, it's about not hearing about them, because you won't hear about them, because it doesn't involve the monetary system. People like Mark Boyle, um, who actually sort of set up the economy website, he's lived for the last two years now without money. And a woman in Germany has lived for the last two and a half years without money, just offering her services, going around to people, accepting that it is possible. We're even showing that it's possible now, even within the path of this 
you know, this basically irrelevant, obsolete system, which is basically killing all life on the planet and probably will sort of make the planet a rock eventually to carry on this way. But it's possible. I mean, until you actually know about these things and until you do the research and find out that these things aren't actually possible already, and that's smaller scale and growing, even without the sort of things that the movement talks about, about using scientific and technology to manage resources efficiently and intelligently for the benefit of everybody. Does it do work like that? Do you help share those ideas about how people can live with less money? When, when, I'm on, when I'm on stores, when I'm going around stores in London, you bet. I, I, mean, I, I mean, the examples that I've just given, I give left, right and centre to say, look into them, you know, just, just see how they operate, how... And also the beauty of some of them is that they're often, de- in, in a similar way to the movement, they're quite decentralised. Free cycle has groups, but there's nothing else going on. There are moderators, but that's about it. I'm just, I'll just add to that briefly. I'm, I'm a drum teacher, and I, I had a kid come through who, who had three lessons, absolutely loved them, and, and, and then he couldn't afford the lessons. Um, and I couldn't find a trade, couldn't find anything, and someone else, you know, wanted to wanted to fill that slot, um, and it broke my heart. But this system forced me, because of my mortgage payments and everything else, forced me to have to say to that kid, "I'm sorry, you're gonna have to leave." And then there's some kids who walk through the door who've been coming to me for years, and they couldn't care less. Mummy, dad, mummy and daddy pay fifteen quid for them to come to me for half an hour for babysitting. They don't care about the drums. In a resource-based economy, I'd go to the drum centre, you know, maybe, and I'd engage with people who are genuinely interested in it. I'd love to give my time to teach people who want to learn. I'd love to. I'd sit there and go, oh, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? And it'd be a much more enthralling way of doing it rather than sit there for half an hour, monkey, you know, teach, teach, monkey boy. You know what I mean? It's, you know, like with a whip behind me with a big dollar on the end of it, cracking my, <laughs> my ass. You know, do, 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 you follow, do you follow what I mean? Is the this system forces you to do, do things you don't want to do. We're having this lovely conversation in here, but the fact is we're all going to go out into this system afterwards and do our jobs and pilfer and feed and lie to get whatever we want. <laughs> and the thing is, that's, now that sounds, no, that sounds like, oh, oh, that's terrible. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you honesty, here's honesty. You come to me for a drum lesson and there's a drum teacher next door who's better than me in every single way and he's looking for students the same way I am and you ask me who the best drum teacher is for you, I will lie to you. I will lie to you because I don't care about your drum tuition and my family and our, you know, their food is on the line. To be perfectly honest, screw your lessons. That's what the system makes you do. Do you, do you know what? I, do you see what I mean? Is that you can't afford to be honest? It's that oh, it's like that George Carlin line. Oh, I wish our politicians were honest. Honesty would fuck this up. It would be the worst thing that could possibly happen. And another uh, <laughs> thing to uh, back that up. I did a little bit of research, um, and the Institute for Volunteering research based at uh, London University. 22 million people last year in the UK volunteered time which would benefit other people other than their close relatives. Um, which, which backs up, um, it was estimated that that's worth £22 billion to the economy. And that backs up a, a, a Gallup, a major Gallup poll in the 1990s in America where over 50% of the adult population contributed uh, four hours a week to uh, activities which benefited people who weren't their friends or close relatives or anything like that. People want to do something to create a better community, a better society. And another interesting take on that is that the numbers of people, um, there was a trend, even more people were volunteering a few years ago, but because of the recession, People are saying in, in, the, in the research that they want to volunteer but they can't because of time, commitments of work, and things like that. Um, I have seen that on your website, uh, registered for like a few movements, and I've been to uh, Occupy London a few times. And I'm not sure, but I've seen you guys on the Saturday of the 15th, you were there with. Big um, banner and everything, but have you gone ever since back then? Because it was like a university where 
We have different discussions where people talk about uh, how the economy is, we talk about different debates worldwide, and actually at the moment, in the General Assembly, we are talking about demands that we want to uh, put forward in terms of to the government or to like, any other changes that can happen. I would like to know it. Um, the, answer, um, the answer is, is yes. Um, in fact, there's actually quite less tent um, during the intensity. Um, the movies have been, I think, Jim was involved yes, in a Q&A yes. &A session of one of the movies. Um, I gather that Cliff and other people are arranging speaking slots at the new Finsbury Square site. Um, so yes, actually the movement is engaging people constantly, and that's not just in London, that's actually wherever there is an Occupy site, that we, we've communicated with each other to say, we need to have a presence at these Occupy sites, we have to do. Simply because, there, certainly from my perspective, I began to hear a lot of conversations about reform of the monetary system, about how that could possibly solve things, and obviously, as we've all heard tonight, Certainly longer term, it's, it's, it's patchwork, it's not going to work. This system, a monetary system actually is just, it's a social and environmental train wreck at the end of the day. Um, so it's, it, we are actually doing that. We are engaging with people on all sorts of levels and offering them these aims, these directions, these goals and actually saying that you don't have to do things this way, you don't have to patch this up. It doesn't work. We need to do something different. And it's very interesting that on the, I think it's the Occupy Britain website, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure guys, but I think on the Occupy Britain website, and in fact on one of the plaques, the placards that they actually have on the side of St Paul's going towards where the service tents are, it actually has a series of demands. And I was so astonished that I was actually putting online everywhere, saying to people, oh my god, but in, they, they want a resource-based economy, but they haven't got a name to it yet. And I was just, oh my god, where did that come from? Because Occupy has all sorts of views, a real sort of very broad school of people thinking in different ways about recognising that this system is flawed and it's failing, but not quite knowing what to do about that. And it was just astonishing that those two instances, one on the website, one on the placard, said, it was like um, a recognition of everything we're talking about. It's amazing. So, I mean, in that sense, that's a really obvious movement towards thinking in this way. Yeah. So, yes. Well, one of the guys who spent many nights in the tent in St. Paul's is actually here tonight. Yeah. Nobody wants to say a few words. Um, well, me and some other people, Michael, right there. Yes, Steve. Yes, yes, Ashley James, Matthew and Bill. So there's all three of us. Yeah, we maintain 24 hour <laughs> presence. <laughs> and what's your experience in here sort of like of being in that place? I mean, are you engaged? Are people engaging with you? Are you engaging with them? How's that, oh, how's yeah. that been? Yes, everybody engaging with everyone, really. Mm. And it's a very free people. Mm. Uh, there's a kitchen set up there, taking donations, and all the food is free. Uh, yeah, the chefs food. don't get paid. <laughs> chefs don't get paid. <laughs> no one gets paid. Mm. It's just brilliant. Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. It's it's really people got something for free though, they're just eating the food, like that. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> that's what we're always told. Yeah, people are naturally greedy, aren't they? Yeah, people are just yeah. naturally greedy. They'll sit on their, their couches just eating potato chips all day, flipping between <laughs> X-Facts with Big Brother. Surely. So, you, see, you can see we all laugh at that, because actually what's going on at St Paul's is a little bit of a resource-based economy. And what's the mainstream media done? All they've done is talk about the, the, diff the, the differences between the church and the people. They, they don't really hone in on the issues, because actually the issues really genuinely attack at the core mechanisms of this system and the people who place the values, value, the intrinsic value. And, you know, so you've, the mainstream media is fascinating like that. They'll look at everything but the core issue, everything and anything. They're just, they're doing, their job. They're just doing their job. They're just doing their job. And interestingly enough, I mean, on the one occasion where the one show? Yeah, where the one show actually tried to bring this 
banker of 40 years standing to actually talk to everybody and say how wonderful the banks were. I mean, there were, I could, I remember seeing at least four, actually, you know, five people, one of whom was like a, a young woman with a, with a baby, who just completely shot the man down in flames. It was so obvious. And at the end of the day, he was literally brought to be speechless. In fact, there was a member of the movement, one of, one of, one of the members of the movement, Ben, Ben McLeish, actually, gives quite a lot of lectures around, around the world. Um, he basically brought up the whole technological unemployment, end of the labour labour for income game, and the man was speechless, and all he could say is, oh, and yes, I fear for my children too. <laughs> 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 that, that was one of the last responses he had to come down there to take on the present, uh, you know, uh, the uh, protester. And the last, was the, one of the last bits was him basically saying, oh, I guess I fear for my children, and then the cameras went dead and they never put that out on the BBC. Right, yeah. It is on YouTube, yeah. I think. You know, yeah. We've got a couple of questions. Oh, yes, this gentleman down here. People have yes. spoken before. Cliff. Yeah. This, this yeah. gentleman down here. Yeah. I mean, anyways, there's not too much of a question, but just to uh, enforce what you just said, speaking about the Occupy, um, there was a guy that couldn't come tonight, but he had the slot uh, today at 12, so he did the speech on what is money. And I, I think that the, the, the one thing that, that I think that he yeah, said, and the, the, the one thing that I take from uh, Tigers, and you know, we hear these questions, what do you do? Tangible results, concrete actions, what, what do you do? And I think that the, the, the point that you mentioned, that the, the film is so important. And well, the film is just a movie, but for me, Tigers is sort of a way to uh, put things that I was maybe not so aware before. You know, but I knew that there was this wrong, this wrong, and Maybe put things into a framework that makes it more, you know, like logical, combined. And, I, and, and to me, Tiger is really is, is mainly uh, I do what I want. You know? I've been spending the afternoon with uh, Francesca playing the piano, singing with people around, and I didn't tell them I am Tiger. No, I, is is uh, still getting a couple of privilege. And then, as you say in the kitchen, you know, we were in the kitchen, we left a couple of uh, uh, leaflets explaining what is tiger. So people are they, they can not they can do what they want. But, but to me, really, it's about having this material, it's just a couple of hours, and saying to people, well, if you like to have a view of something that makes sort of one direction, you know, it's a suggestion. Uh, something that you can use as material, and it's easy to refer to other people who maybe are not asking for shit, why, what should I do with this, uh, you know, what is money, resource based economy, what does it mean, uh, why do we do this, why am I paying that, stuff like that. You know, I, I think it puts everything into one framework, which is, you know, I have to be careful with things into one framework, it doesn't mean that you don't ask any more questions, mm -hmm. but that's, that's, yeah, and actually that is debated a lot in the uh, Occupy or other places actually, it's I guess when we, uh, every month, uh, maybe we can speak about the, the screenings that are happening and the uh, passing cloud, but uh, yeah, everybody does what they want, you know, it's really a um, resource, and then you use it as you want. Yes, you use it in, thing. it's a tool you use in, you know, creative manners, I mean, I, I, pop it into everyday conversation, you know, so you give it a label, like saying, I don't, I don't go and, oh, it's that, and everything, or, but yes, you do use it in a lot of creative different ways, I mean, I've done a lot of my own personal presentations with a lot of my, my own ways of expressing this direction, as well as many other people have done, it's, it doesn't really matter what the label is, guys, this is the other important thing, is that, call it a resource-based economy, call it the zeitgeist, economy, call it whatever you, you, you want, it's, it doesn't escape the intrinsic logic of, this, of the model, of the system. It's, it's not up to your opinion. It's arrived at by just inferential logic, physical referential law, rather than abstract language, you know, or semantics, or what your opinion is about this, or what my opinion is about that. You can have whatever opinion you want when the food's running out, but ultimately, you know, the food's running out, so you've got to do something about 
to get around that problem, and that's essentially a raw base plan. Yes. Did we say we had a question? Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. like everything, um, the idea is, it's, I don't think it's very good. Like, I think, um, from my point of view, yeah, I know that things, lots of things are wrong, yeah? many things to sort, to sort out, and I have my ideas where I like, you have about the better world, yeah? but my question is, like, uh, what is the step from moving from the thought and the ideas to the real action? Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To make real changes. So, once, for example, lots of people, when you make this, this kind of city that you want to do, yeah, like this project, yeah. This I think Greece would be a good place to start. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so eventually a population that is exposed to this idea and demands it might be a test country. For example, a place that it wants to foster us, <laughs> take us in to build a, a, a test city, ultimately, yeah. so that we can invite people and, and you know uh, in, and we can ex expose this idea and concept to the world in a much more physical way. We walk around, we show people the building, what, you know, we show people how life would be there, and ultimately they'll go back to their countries, they'll go back to their crappy jobs, yeah, and they'll basically go, what the hell am I doing? And at that point, and then couple that up with the pressures of, I'll tell you what you're doing, you're going to work an extra hour because if you don't, you're not going to feed your family. They're going to be, screw this, buddy. Do you know what I mean? We want to do what they're doing. And that's, and that is how, um, that is how it happens, you know. Um, is That's what the internet's doing. It's, it's sort of created a new global empathy. You yeah? used to have an empathy just in your tribe. Then you had an empathy in a slightly bigger tribe, then a country, then a continent. And now with the internet, it is a world. Why is this Occupy movement everywhere? It is the human immune system responding to the, the whole of humanity being basically completely screwed over by a very, very slim, a slim amount. A slim amount that, by the way, um, don't have access to the, the, whose life would be infinitely better in this as well. Don't forget that. Is I, I use this example is that if an ambulance is stuck in traffic to get to the bottom of the high street, you can be a billionaire or a poor but you're still going to die. It doesn't make any difference. Do you, do you see what I? You see what I mean? Is that everybody will be better off in a system where it, you, you're more equal on you know on an equal standing in terms of your health and your your uh, your needs being met. Then, then you really can have this, this thing that we've always wanted through all, all the philosophical, religious teachings, uh, you know, all of these ideals we've always had have never really been technologically capable, but we're capable of them now if we can just make that shift that we've been talking about for millennia. And that's, all, that's it, that's what, what we essentially, that's the first part of the transition. You don't do that, you can forget building. Right? Or, really. Or, or, or you, you see what I mean? All those pretty buildings you see at the, um, you know, in our films and at the Venus Project site and things don't mean anything without this. Everything, that, these chairs, everything you see, everything the eye touches is a product of thought first. And if you don't change that thought, you don't manifest reality. It just doesn't happen. And that's it. Sorry, I just, yeah, sorry, um, I just wanted to um, point out that we do advocate a resource-based economy or a resource-based uh, resource uh, economic model, but uh, we also want to encourage uh, positive values within society. We, you know, it is a it is a shift in consciousness and in values, and you know, we want to sort of um, promote the idea of you know that some people are just not ju not just deserving more than others. You know, and treat each other like as as ourselves and. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it is a big, big, big value shift. You know, it's not just about the cities and. Yeah, it's not about the city, the city, the city, the city, the city, all the people's mind. Yeah. Because everyone, the change in others, you want to. That's right. It's not that you just change the system. The people are still thinking, okay, we'll talk more, and we'll talk more, and we'll talk more. So, that kind of thinking, the people who instead of a group. I think it's interesting that I've seen that business. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I see that more. Now more people are just getting involved in the thing, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see it. I can see it. I think it's interesting.
interesting as well. I mean, hopping back to just very quickly, just hopping back to something you were saying earlier um, about um, there already being in place sort of volunteer services, other sort of sharing, exchanging services that already exist that you don't hear about. But isn't it interesting, for example, that Cameron and this particular government have actually started talking about the big society? If they really understood what the big society would lead to, I mean, that people would actually find out that volunteering their time, their energy, their own personal resources, might actually potentially impact on the money economy, they might not be talking about it quite so much. It's, it's very interesting that what sometimes does that mean, they... anyway, the big society. What does that mean? But that, the idea, the unpaid idea, labor. Um, so yeah, unpaid labor, basically. And it's an energy term anyway. It's How an energy term. Politics. 20 people, it's all, yeah. 20 what is but, in, in, but in the sense that, you know, it's what, it, it's an empty term in itself, but if people are actually left to their own devices, we want to put it that way, because they don't, they don't have a job anymore, they can't find a job, therefore they can't access money. What do you do in those circumstances? And what you do is you do what you can, and other people will be in the same situation as well, with the use of the internet and various other communication tools, you start sort of talking to each other, and you do things like free cycle, you do things like time banking, you do all of those things. You think so, now about the amount of file sharing, music sharing, film sharing that goes on. There's a whole generation of, you know, teens, 20 year olds, for whom, you know, exchanging things where no money changes hands is normal. Mm -hmm. Corporations don't like it, but actually, that's really good. And they don't see why they should. Yeah. They say the plastic. They're bringing out new laws and, and all these sorts of things to stop music spreading on the internet, and they, let's face it, they are failing. There's a good book called What's Mine is Yeah, by Rachel Bond. Yeah. Which is. Oh, yeah. um, I really appreciate the positivity of this one movie. That's really good. Yeah. I do too. Uh, but I'm going to say the well, one. That's slightly hopefully challenging question. Uh, is, is your vision of a democratic society, would you say? It will be. It will be a bit. Like democratic. <laughs> well, I would say whether well, say in, in what happens is divided yes, very like, evenly. In a sense, it will be it will be the best democracy you've ever had. Because it will be it won't be the election of anything else other than ideas that are just self evident. So at the moment, you put your cross in a box and you get a new dictator every four years, who essentially doesn't want to change the system. Politicians aren't elected to change things, they're elected to keep things the way they are. Because they have established interests that are built into the monetary system. You know, if you have a certain company and you're making a certain product, you don't want people to come in and screw with your product and your profit share. Yeah, that's that you you want to stunt progress. The political system is no different, it's just an outreach of corporate interest. So the, the real democracy would be a democracy of ideas. If you have an idea, you would go um, to a technical team, you would work with them to implement the idea, and it would just be implemented if we have the resources to know how to do it. The resource-based economic model, and this is <coughs> important, is an emergent model. So goods are designed to be recycled and ultimately updated. This is very, very important to our design. It, what we have now is a static state. We want to, like, if you look at the US, they have the Constitution, made in 1776. Do you know what I mean? It's like, where are we now? 2011, they, had, they did everything in that Constitution that say that slavery was wrong. You know, so the point is, is, is we have these old archaic pieces of paper that we sort of run things like we're basically flying in the state of real state of nature, which is emerging and changes over time, and we're standing here going, we don't want it. Well, it doesn't really matter what you want. So in a sense, the democracy would be um, an intelligible democracy of ideas. And it doesn't matter whether you're a pretty face on TV and you get makeup done before you go up there and say some pretty words to people. You can you can be you can be uh, short, flat, round, tall. Doesn't be long hair, short hair. If the words coming out of your mouth are backed up with scientific evidence, you know, then that's the end of it. And no one said, "Well, Darwin, they love your ideas, but you've got a bit of a beard then." 
that don't look like that name. It doesn't, do you see what I mean? Whereas at the moment, politics is a, is a popularity contest about you know, how good you look and how well you elevate yourself, which is ridiculous when you think about it. Yeah, and how well you use language to manipulate people. So, uh, you know, people say, it's a good job you've got strong leadership. What does that mean? What does strong leadership even mean? I don't, know, I don't actually even know what that tangibly means. But you could be leading me into a fire, at least you're strong. That's okay, James, you're going to burn to death. That's so a good saying. Do, do you know what I mean? So I think, in a sense, it would be the best collaborative effort if you want to return in that rather than democracy that we want to know. I mean, there will always be like, um, contentious decisions to be made, and we live on a finite planet, and it will always be a finite planet. There will always be finite resources. There will always be, there will be value, even if everyone agreed on science, there will always be value differences in which direction we will want to take the world. Mm -hmm. uh, how, if there is a contentious decision, how do you make that, how will you make that decision? Well, um, the earth would dictate what we have, the uh, resources we have, how many resources we have, to have what the human needs are, and we would arrive at decisions, not make them, with, uh, with uh, work with uh, computers that gain real time feedback from the environment, using a central uh, uh, computer that, uses, that has all the technical information that we can to write the most strategic. Um, conclusion at that point in time with the knowledge that we had. Uh, for instance, if you need to build a bridge, you would build it with the most empirical uh, materials, using the best methods, uh, for the goal, for it to last as long as possible. All parameters are self-evident, you see. So there is no debate. And this is how um, cities, hospitals, or whatever, would be uh, dealt with. But actually, he's pointing out with um, certain things that are subjective. When something comes in, when this something is subjective, then human consensus would come in. We'd have talks, meetings, and then it would come down to voting at the last resort. When something is subjective, like uh, something like colour of buildings or something, or yeah. although even that could be a technical process. Yeah, I would, I would add that it's very important to define needs and wants. Yeah. Wants are manufactured by the system to. Uh, to treat you as a consumer rather than a human being, because obviously consumption is what the system is based on. So they don't want they want you to consume stuff, um, uh, and and they say you need this product. This is part of your needs. It's not part of your needs. Your your needs can be very clearly defined. You can say that you want um, the, you know your the, the newest product, whatever that may be. But if you don't eat for uh, or, you know a couple of weeks or drink, drink water or breathe air, you're going to die. So it's very easy to quantify needs with an organism. It's, that is self-evident. So if we start there and then, you know, then bridge up, then we are always looking to try to eliminate the, the, that sort of dynamic where, in a sense, where people, if you, if you can prove an idea, it's more important than voting for it. You know, and it, it's going to be beneficial to people. If people can see that, they'll they'll adopt it. Because whereas at the moment we have money stopping people wanting wanting to adopt and engage in progress, it, it's literally a progress stifling operation. And once that is out of the way, I think egos will drop and people will go, "That's a great idea, man." Yeah, buildings could be much better if we made them with a white exterior skin, photovoltaic, to pull in you know sunlight from. Um, to put in sunlight from every angle, so that rather than this all being centralised to one electricity grid, every house produces its own energy, then that's going to be massively abundant. Yeah, let's do that, good idea. Whereas at the moment, if I make houses that are red, be like, and I've got profit out of them, like, you want to make white houses? And I'm shut them up. You know what I mean? And so that's the difference in psychology that, you know, it needs to be. Also, I would, have, I would envisage solutions. Um, you have regional problems that are solved with regional solutions. It's not a one size fits all as well. Yeah. I mean, solutions for the Sahara are not really what you're talking about for solutions for this. So it's a decentralization. So that's terribly important. It's taking things back. People need to reclaim their communities. And their environments and, their, and have much more of a voice than what happens in the world. First, locally, on a micro level, you let them happen. 
then it goes out from there. And it's, pri it's principle is this the system uh, is really built on education. Um, our, our collective um, efforts as a species are contingent upon people being critically educated and taking an interest in all areas of the ecological soundness of their environment and the ecological balance of it. So people would be reinforced in, in this culture uh, and through the education to an extent to understand these, these values rather than the values they're being complicated with at the moment in mainstream education, which is really just a funnel in blood to push them into, you know, to a job you know, for life. Like, one of the questions they ask is, well, what do you want to be when you're older? As if there's only one thing. How limiting is that for a five-year-old? Hey, what do you want to be when you're older, little Johnny? Oh, I want to be a fireman. Like, there's only one that, well, how about we just build houses that don't set alight? But we, you know, you know what I mean? Solve that problem so that we don't have to send little Johnny in when he's 22 into a burning building and go come out and ball the fire. That would be cool. Jim, can I just... <laughs> going back to your original point, yeah. how much involvement do you have today, do you think, in democracy? How does it affect your life day to day? You really yeah, very little. Right? I mean, I believe in direct democracy, so I don't believe in the necessary system we've got now. But I'm just wondering, there just seems to be a little bit of a, a gap where well, the, the, the decision-making system... Yeah, the gap, the gap lies between what people culturally project in their backgrounds onto things that they really need to live, yeah? So everybody in here probably has a fridge. I would say that probably most of you don't know how the fridge works. But you don't care because it keeps your food cold. You know, it doesn't turn itself off at half six to piss you off when you get home at home. It just does what it's supposed to do because that's what it needs to do. And it's the same thing. You can have a factory full of people there working. There could be Sikhs, Christians, Muslims all working together. At the end of the day, the aeroplane comes out and it still flies. You know? It's, it's like if you go into surgery, people talk about opinions and stuff like that. If you have a family member in surgery, the surgeons don't get the rest of the family around and say, right, so which bit of the which organ should we take out first? <laughs> no, the surgeons do it because they know what they're doing, you know? Yeah, but there are value choices. Like, a surgeon can give you the risk. The, 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 they can give you all the science, but ultimately there will be different choices. Some people will take a risk, some people wouldn't. I wonder if I can like mm. a town, but I might build a bridge with a certain amount of risk. Oh my well, God. Like, in San Francisco, they're building a bridge because then there could be an earthquake, you know? Everything is human beings can't control everything. The ultimate government on this planet is nature. And it's a dictatorship whether we like it or not. A tsunami doesn't give a shit who you vote for or how much you earn. It's just gonna wash your house away. You know? The same with the earthquake. So we have to kind of base everything on, on naturally what supports us. You know? Natural law. Natural law is the only it's real the law. Only law. It's the only law. Everything else is made up. When you think about it logically, you, yeah. you can't dance on the scene. There are they can't vote for those. And, and the, other, the other important thing about the voting aspect, which you brought up earlier about, you know, a relative, there might be there might be a value decision to make as to whether uh, their life support machine should be turned off or not. Okay, well in this system, let's just say it's you know my grandmother. Okay, she's going to give me a lot of money. I'm in quite a lot of debt at the moment. It's a difficult question. Do you know what I mean? You instantly. You know, we all go, oh, well, I never thought of that. I never thought that about Granny. Yeah, you did. You thought about, I could probably go on holiday two weeks after she gets in. And what a horrible thing to think about one of your loved ones. But this system, you can't help but think about it. You can't help but think about vested interests. You can't stop what the brain does. It does go, like, you know, like that ping into your head. Like, oh, no, go away. I feel like a bad person now for thinking that. You're not a bad person. You're reinforced to think that way because of your survival mechanisms. So to be perfectly honest, I don't know what moral decisions I'll come to in a resource-based economy because I've never lived in a society where I haven't had a vested interest in something else or someone else for my own personal gain. I've never had that happen. So to be honest, I think your moral and cultural impressions will completely change to such a degree in that you can't even quantify what democracy will mean in it. Won't, it, it will just be such a different, faraway concept when your reference points and your physical reference feedback from the environment influencing your behaviour will be so different that you, you'll just be an alien to it. You'll be like, voting? Christ, why did I ever think that's it? We will just solve this problem with it. Yeah. So, if we get to that point, what would be left? Oh, man, you'll be 
Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, any other questions? Uh, that's a good one in case it doesn't get messy, yeah? like you like you said before. But if it gets messy, is there an alternative? No. From the <laughs> we're, 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 we're all going to go up in a ball of our own flames. Oh, maybe not a ball of us. Um, no, I mean, we, we don't advocate. We don't advocate force. We don't advocate violence. More than more than any other reason, it doesn't really work. Our, our idea for social change is very much built into the model of um, Martin Luther King and Gandhi: is peaceful non-participation. You know, ultimately, violence begets more violence. An eye for an eye only makes the whole world blind. We can't one one organism at war with itself on a planet. You know, it's supposed to be living together is often what he's doing. We have enough, we, we have enough violence yeah, in I've history. Done, done we have enough violence. of that. We've done 10,000 years that's of it. Alone, it doesn't really work. Um, and, and ultimately, that's the sort of transition we're talking about. It, we're, we certainly are not going to engage in no, violence, that's other that's than to protect true. yourself, I suppose. But we don't want to even get to that stage. We want people to. The violence and the wars that you see. If there was no money, my granddad said this to me when they were going into QA when I was 11 years old. He said, Boy, if they sell carrots, we wouldn't be there. And he was right. He was, he was right. That is what war is. And they distract you with, Do you think it's right? Samuel was a monster, wasn't he? La 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 la. And they get you all debating about it whilst they basically bomb everything, send in oil companies to rebuild it, walk off with all the money and go, and Look at all them debate. No. Oh well, I've got a new Lamborghini. The, 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 do you know what? Do you see what I mean? War is a profit-making machine. Violence begets violence, and ultimately, we've got to move really past that. I'm not speaking about violence and war. I'm speaking about um, if the system crashes down, mm. like really crashes down, and no one else knows what to do. Will this lead to war or not? I don't really care. No, it won't. I won't. I'm not talking about war. That's what I mean. If the world gets to a point where a solution is needed to pass to the next level, does the movement happen? Yes, yes. Yes, of course. Can you, if it happens next year, uh, yeah, can okay. you do something about it? Can you be so strong in every point of the, of the world yes, we can. so that you can make people understand, okay, we, we don't have to go political again, we don't have to no. get again with the monetary system and go 400 years and see that it's all going to happen again. We need to start from the bottom and go another direction. Yeah, so you're able to do it. Team humanity. That's, what we're, doing. That's, what, we're doing. That's what, we're doing. what we're doing. In fact, actually, I view this as a bit of a ticking time bomb, okay? Sure. You have a net of people that will either be enlightened enough, educated enough, and critical in mass enough so that when the bottom does fall out of the system, there's a safety net. To say, guys, stop killing each other. Time out. We don't have to do that anymore. We're really, really clever, okay? You don't have to actually do that. Okay, you don't have to listen to these people who don't give a shit about you. Yeah, we could all work together and do this thing. And if that net's not big enough, then I fear what will happen. And that's why we're here, because we are up against. I don't need to be, I don't need to be Dr. Death or dramatic, but you're on a time limit here, people. This, this is not going, you know, Kansas is going by by, basically. And we're either going to create this critical mass and catch people, move on the way up to something more sustainable and sensible, or we're going to face, as I said earlier, face the consequences. And that's really all you can do, isn't it? What else do you do? Agree? Do you agree that the system works for, uh, I don't know, a quarter of the, of the world? 35 percent. No, the system with that and everything, yeah? yeah. As in compared to what, what the size of the, the whole world is, yeah? Yeah. So if the system in these countries breaks down, and you need to come up with a solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other the other countries that obviously live already outside of the system, they already have the, the solution to the problem. Don't you think that you should start from there and, and build yourself up? Because I think you, you're fighting Goliath. You're trying to, to I don't know, to convert the leaders of the world and sort of things like that and make them think like you and make them act like you instead of Getting everybody that's not yet in the system to just stay like that. That's a very good point. In fact, that's why I, I do TZ education because I go into schools and talk to children about this because ultimately they haven't 
had to have this despotic view of humanity imposed on them for long enough to just go, we're just bad, we're never going to change together. Ultimately, kids, kids get this in such a funny way and just make that look sort of like such a bunch of idiots that it's, it's really quite illuminating. Um, and, and so I feel that the, the, that generation needs to be informed, and in a way they are, you know, they're getting like environmental sustainability messages into their school and things. So by the time you hit them, I've done these presentations in front of 16 year old, 15 year old kids, and by the time you hit them with them, they're like, why the hell are we doing that? This is just obvious, isn't it? You know, they, they get it, and you go, well, they're not even, they have lived in the world long enough. It's not naivety. Adults get to a point where they forget what it's like. To just run into a playground and go, I don't care that you're black, white, small, let's just play on the jungle gym. Why, what, is, what is naive or stupid about that? There's nothing naive or stupid about that. It's naive or stupid to go out in this game that we're doing, ruining our planet. But apparently, us adults are trying to tell kids how to behave. That's the biggest joke I've ever heard in my life. It's ridiculous. How can people possibly have that viewpoint of children? So, in a sense, it, this, is, this movement is based on education of Humanity as a whole, but there is some more low hanging fruit out there. I would love to see, you know, Greece being given this message right now, or, or wherever it is. And I agree with you. I do agree. But I don't live in Greece, and eventually the planet is going to have to do this together. Greece, yeah. Greece has got the biggest zeitgeist tractor. Yeah, you know, and there's a reason for that because that, that's their immune system going, going. You know, in flames basically going, whoa, we've got a really big problem. They have got a fantastic chapter, that's an excellent point, you know? And so we are doing great work there. We're doing great, we, some of our greatest work is in the places that are most messed up. So, and that, there's a, but you see, there's a reason for that, that's my point. Isn't that interesting? It sort of alludes to your point that where the biggest problems are, we see the, the sort of our movements going, because it's, it's mushrooming, because people are going, whoa, it's a big problem. Again, we talk about that. We talk about, about the biosocial pressures in those countries, in those parts of the world where those biosocial pressures are really starting to break through. Yeah. Those are exactly the places where activity seems to be greatest because there's a recognition that this just doesn't work. It doesn't look after people. It doesn't look after the environment. So what do we do now? And therefore, you're able, or the movement, to sort of feed into that and say, "Well, guys, hang on a second, like." Just recognise that already this happens, that happens, you know, it's not based on money, you know, it's, again, exchange of time, facilities, resources, without money. So it's possible, so why don't we explore that a little bit more? And when you're more research, that word. Um, what? It's got yeah. such a connotation, explore. Uh, well, I mean, if you, yeah, but you, I mean, so you have to, you have to engage people with something. If you don't engage with something, then nothing's going to happen anyway. So if you're not in, I use explore in that sense, it's about if you, if you have to engage with somebody before they can even begin to discuss with you what they're talking about. So and that to me is an exploration of what we're talking about. People have to sort of do their, as we've said already this evening, don't believe the bloody word we say, because I mean you can ask us as many questions and we'll give the best answers that we think we have, to meet your questions, but that ain't the end of it. It really isn't the end of it. You need to please go away and just make sure that what we're saying it makes any sense. We won't can catch we, a politician saying that anytime soon. Can we bring a couple of people in who haven't spoken yet? Um, I want to just about something from the other uh, 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 If we told the rest, we, I mean, USA, the country of Europe, uh, the wealthier one, uh, we told the rest of the world about this system and we exploit the rest of the world with this system. Now that um, for more than 40 years, now that there are countries like the so-called BRICS and Iran or Argentina, which are growing with this system, how we should uh, tell them, oh, look, everything is wrong. Now we, we have another one, another system. <laughs> how they, they will believe that? But for us, yeah. we represent the have less than the percent of population. Have you looked at the interconnection between the debt between the various countries? Have yes, we Have a look at the diagrams of the interconnection of debt. They're not happy. The whole thing is going to come down. It, it, because, because money money started off in small little pockets in tribes with little 
of seashells and, and all that kind of stuff. And what happened as humanity got more technologically capable, the hydrocarbon economy, the internet, um, the, the fusion of banking systems, the starting of um, uh, Wall Street, the phenomenon of Wall Street, um, and, uh, and other you know, parasitic money organizations such as that. Um, and gradually, yeah, like Chanan says, you've had this, this sort of gluing together of interests. You know, people talk about China being the new rulers of the world and everything. Remember, that is contingent upon selling their goods to the US. So people go, oh, it's bad that the US has got that much debt to China. Mate, there's something in it for China as well. If they can't export all of their goods to the US, they're not looking good either. So everybody has this monetary sequence of value, as we talked about in the presentation, orientation and interconnection to each other based on the system is intrinsically flawed and come down in the way. So with regards to those countries and us reaching out to them, it, this is why the zeitgeist movement is what it is. In a sense, it is our job, but it also isn't. It's, that's why we have a chapter in those countries you're talking about. That's why we have a movement there. For the grassroots development of this consciousness and this understanding. Shifts, good social shifts in human systems, always come from the people. They don't come prescribed from their your leaders. They never do. Because they, because they have an establishment to or order to keep keep in, in place and eventually the human population go, you're screwing us over buddy, and they get together and say enough is enough. And and and, and ultimately um, that's why we have this chapter orientated system where we where you know we we're strategically basically planting ourselves around the globe, interconnecting ourselves in the same way they've interconnected their selves, I suppose, and sort of Breaking, breaking out of the mold, so they're on the outside, we're on the inside, hopefully we're going to mushroom out, and it is mushrooming, that's the point, that's why we said like in Greece we've got a good chapter, because that's the mushroom effect, that's us going in there, setting up a chapter, having these conversations, people going away, investigating things, applying themselves to this direction in the way they feel is most valid towards them and their background and their talents and their abilities, and slowly that consciousness will grow. I completely agree with that, but uh, what I see is that the biggest corporation companies, they moved their, um, their job there because those people have to consume their goods, not us. We, as a population, will become poorer than, than what we are now, but because those people have, are feeling the improvement, I mean, all the... Uh, the improvements in every th everyday life, for example, a person in Brazil who has a job, they can buy a car. You mean that's pointless, but not for him, because he never had a car. So, and those represent like, uh, let's say, three billions of people. We are 50, 500 million. So it's, uh, the numbers are much more bigger than what we think. We are talking about this thing, which is beautiful. Here, Europe and US mostly. Those countries are not aware. And, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't understand how we can teach them again. Like, oh look, everything was wrong. No. And again, you know, we're, we're talking as, as things as they are, and you're saying that there are certain sort of people, a certain group of people in certain societies in certain countries who appear to be benefiting from that. However, the, it doesn't detract from the fact that all the things that we've spoken about, be it technological unemployment, be it debt, be it the interconnectedness of the way that this monetary system operates, are going to affect people eventually. Again, it's the whole biosocial pressure thing. It's like, you may be actually doing okay in this system for a while, but unless you actually get up towards the 1%, then, you know, you're going to lose your job because eventually either the machine's going to take it away, or, you know, your car's going to break down, and, you know, unless somebody is actually, unless you're prepared to pay enough to get it serviced, you won't have a car anymore. Um, they isn't enough money to pay for the car. Um, you know, all of these things, you know, they, it's, it's, it's happening already. So regardless of the fact that somebody seems to be actually seeing improvement now, that improvement is short-lived simply because the system is collapsing. 
it is actually coming to an end. It's a finite system. It's mathematically, environmentally, and socially impossible. It cannot maintain itself. So even if you see, again, it's the whole short-term thinking, is that thinking, oh, well, I can afford my car now. But actually, what did you, one, what did your car really cost? Two, are you going to be able to remain at a level where you can afford to even maintain that car, let alone buy a new one? Thirdly, when things like technological unemployment start to hit even more than they are now, it's serious enough now, but it's going to get a lot worse, then you know what? You've got the job. Awesome. And then you can't even meet your basic needs. So, short, is that short term, short term is short term thinking? I, I, I completely agree with you, but uh, that's uh, like a human uh, question because uh, well, we, with that system we are going to think that people will come in, let's say, 500 years because we are saving the planet for them. But we are like a poli like politician, we live just around 70 or 80 years. So. But then, but the, you know, again, if you sort of think about it in Occupy terms, it's like the 99% are the ones who are actually being screwed over, they don't get anything out of the system, they'll just like struggle away, and the struggle in the end is just going to fall apart because they're not going to have any jobs, therefore they don't have any money, therefore their needs can't be met. And when you're talking about such a huge grand swell of people actually building up who, just by dint of that environment, will actually be much more open to taking something like this on board, you reach critical mass much, much, much more quickly. So regardless of what those people who actually sort of have just come across their car or who do have money already at the moment, regardless of all of that, it's it's doomed. It's doomed anyway. And the, the beauty of this is that because it's a grass movement and because it's everywhere, because there are chapters everywhere, both in the more wealthy pockets and the less wealthy pockets, absolutely everywhere. The information is always there. Oh, I'll also, yeah, I'll also add that if you view that as a problem, look for a tangible solution. This, this, is, this, is, a, this is quite a, a sort of critical thing, is that people worry. There's really no re any reason to worry, because you either have a solution to that problem, you need to have a clear head and a clear rationale and tangibly look to solve that problem. Yeah. Or you you don't have a problem. You're not prepared to. You don't have a solution. You're not prepared to live for it. You couldn't care less. Then why bother worrying? There's literally never any point in worrying. So that particular problem, if you you know, because people go, well, we're not going to solve that problem. So a resource-based economy isn't going to work. Okay, die in a pub for your own shit. And it's like, yeah, yeah I think I will. Well, what are you worrying about then? No, no, no. I, no, I don't mean that. I mean, that's not that's not directed at you. But do you see my point? Is people put up surface association objections to the system. With, and then when you go, okay, so what's your solution? And they go, well, um, is it outside natural law? Yeah. So you can stand up in front of the tsunami and say, no! <laughs> really? Do you, do you know what I mean? I, I, that's not directed at you, I'm just saying. No, 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 if, you find a problem, the key. if you find a problem, guys, you've got to look to try and solve it in a tangible no, manner. No. no, education is the key. Education the is the key. People, the people are aware of it. The more they will agree That's why when I came to this movement, right? I came to this movement, I sat in the audience at Z Day 2010, and basically I was like, well, obviously we have to educate kids to understand, you know, the, their connection to each other, the environment, like, you know, um, to basically sniff out and detect and kill the bullshit wherever it may roam. Yeah? Basically, obviously, this system was built on that, yeah? And so there wasn't an education movement at the time. It wasn't something that wanted to validate the educational proposals of a resource-based economy and bring them in an activist sense into the school model. So I went, and you know, and I could have easily sat there and gone, why have we got this yet? I just went, well, I'm going to do it. So I did it, you know? And, and then the following year, um, I launched my website at the world event, Z Day 2011. And since then, I've been to many different schools. I've got a full, fully fledged um, science and sustainability exhibition that was set up in the schools and show all the kids and, and everything. And I didn't need a leader to tell me to do that. I didn't need someone, you know, people go, well, why aren't you doing this yet? Why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you doing it? You do it. Do you, do you know what I mean? This is what I mean. This is why it's a leaderless movement. No one told um, David to be the Watford chapter coordinator. 
You know, no one told Adam to be the street team coordinator. No, no one told any of us to take these roles. We just we, we just identified that there was a gap that needed filling, moved into it passionately, and pushed it. You know, and um, and that's kind of what I mean. So education is very very important. That's why I moved into it. And if anybody wants to help me in that direction, please do go to tzmeducation.org. Um, Take a look at my site there. Have a little fish around. Um, and if you work in the education system, if you if you can get me into a school uh, to talk to sixth formers or, or secondary school, I'm my best with at the moment um, in that particular area. Uh, please do go to my website and send me a message through the contact link and help help me out because I genuinely don't get my, much help on this. I'm kind of one man operation. I still have to go to work, but if you appreciate how critically important it is to educate children in a way that isn't indoctrinated into a system that's built on lies, then uh, please do help me. Just picking up on, on education, maybe um, uh, could you please guys talk uh, a bit about what uh, you uh, or us as a scientist can do um, on a day-to-day -day basis to sort of to spread this, this message? In the London chapter, for example, what activities do we we put together and as many people want to know to take part in them? Um, at the moment, we're, um, we're basically, um, as the gentleman earlier asked, um, we have regular chapter meetings to discuss what activities might be most relevant. Um, the activities that we're undertaking are um, regular Mostly monthly stalls, again, because of why there's going to be a break because we wanted to make as much out of that as possible, but there will be money again shortly. Um, we've got events like this that are now taking place every month. Um, we also try and what we are doing is, as part of a sort of like an external liaison sort of service, we're actually trying to contact other groups who understand what the movement's actually saying and have a general sense of like the direction that we're going in and trying to organise being at their events, um, possibly even um, offering our volunteer services. And we have like a volunteer, thanks for volunteers, and we can offer those volunteer services to these other groups and their events. Um, there was a a Typeface Media Festival recently that was basically global um, and part of that in many parts of the world was actually a, was a food and um, a clothes drive uh, which again is part of that more active second phase it's about actually showing that we're supporting that we understand the problems we're not just sitting back it's not just ideas yes it, obviously it's mostly that and getting people to understand what the movement's about and where it's heading but actually having an active participation in society, so that we're actually promoting sort of, if you want, sort of communities and promoting self self management, promoting all the the aims and the ideas that we talk about. And the intention is that we're going to actually be involved in more activities. The stores are going to become even more frequent, as long as I can get volunteers to do what can do. Um, so just basically just putting on more and more and more of these events. There are some other things in the pipeline as well. It also takes quite a lot of, um, of courage to move in this direction, you know? I mean, uh, I'm sandwiched between my very, very religious family on one side and the other side of my family are absolutely raving free market capitalists. Like, oh my God, if you talk about anything about the monetary market system, you are Satan. Basically, so I'm sandwiched between these these two sort of uh, very indoctrinated views, um, one way or another. And I, I came out with this, and I get attacked on Facebook all the time. I'm surprised they even want to talk to me. Anymore. Some of the things they call me. These people are things are people that I've placed my subjective expectations and my moral values in over time. And I, I really admire my uncle. I really admire. You know, I really admire these people who are very close to me and everything. See what you think of that. Oh my god, and you bastard. You know, you're just kind of like, whoa. You know, you have to expect to be attacked. I said, like, I, um, uh, there, was a, there was a guy who screamed at me in the street the other day as I handed him, a, as I handed him the leaflet, and the police tried to arrest me on the last stall I was at, which was pretty funny. Um, and uh, basically, you know, you're going to be attacked. 
fine. You just you, you know it, it takes it takes a sort of measure of uh, courage, really. You know, without sort of trying to do my own horn or whatever it is. But you, you do actually have to step up in front of people who are indoctrinated <coughs> into this culture in one way or another, and who have fixated on very strong beliefs and break them. And actually, and that's that's quite that's quite hard. For instance, I had bucket loads of opinions. They were completely full of crap before I came to this. You know, and it was it rocked my world because I was as I went through, I was like, no, 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 it's not going to work as this way. No, no, no. Uh, shit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And that's some realization that you're wrong or something. So it is a that you go, go, I think, initially through a little bit of a painful phase where you start to drop a few of your opinions, you know, and sort of realize some of the things you place value in and things that start to crumble. You get a few attacks from your friends and family who's told you a utopianist or whatever it might be. And you, you just go, well, you still haven't answered my point, you know, you still haven't answered my question. Do you, do you see what I mean, guys? It, it, you have to come to terms with that as well, that people will laugh at you and they'll denigrate you, and then eventually they'll come around to what's true because human beings. Uh, can I just say, it's the sign of a person who has a poor argument when they have to resort to attacks on character like that. Yeah. Character assassination is yeah. actually a product of, of that. And, and you notice how the political establishment is an expert at this. Like I said about conspiracy theories. How, how wonderful is that? You don't want to be called a conspiracy theorist now, do you, people? You do not want to have an alternative view of a situation I mean, that would be dangerous. You must subscribe to the mainstream opinion. You know, because you don't want to be outcast from the herd. That would be terrible. You could be picked off. The one you know what I mean? And, and of course, you, you now, when you recognise that, you're like, man, that's stupid. No one will go, that makes sense. But in reality, that is what they use, and it is what happens, which is fascinating. One thing we do need more of is online activists. It's not all getting out into the streets and going to flash mobs. And uh, leaflet and DVD distribution, uh, demonstrations, down to the Occupy. From the comfort of your own armchair, you can be a very effective activist. Um, people in the movement across the globe are contributing towards saturating the internet with this information, which isn't our information, it's, it's it's the science, it's the train of thought which starts from what are the problems, let's look at it in a completely open, objective way, and then follow that through to you end up with well, what could be the solution to this. And we're confident if people get on the train of thought, they will end up at the solution that we've ended up with. We need, we need a sustainable uh, planet, which is maintained in equilibrium, uh, with resource management strategically planned and allocated equally, uh, utilizing cybernetics and all of that. Now, all of this information needs to be thrown out there one way or the other. We need people online as well as on the street. I think because part of that is to I think part of that is to recognise that you know this system does drive people into sort of full time work. It's very exhausting. Um, it's very numbing. Um, you know, I, I mean, we all accept that. I mean, however, um, you know, even if you're not able to engage the public face to face or anything like that, as Cliff says, just being able to some as long as this makes sense. Once you've actually done your own research and come to your own conclusion that this makes sense, then you, every single one of you, are all potentially tools to actually bring about change. And in fact, just sitting on your computer, just as Cliff says, just getting the information out there, having debates, having discussions with people, introducing them to the information that you've actually got, then that's, that's every. God forbid I should ever quote Tesco, but definitely. <laughs> 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 Does anyone have any other questions? I was just going to say, like, being an activist, just having a conversation with somebody who's interested in sort of sociology or technology or something, just 
Just talking to people can be really helpful. Coming to coming tonight was the, was the first. That's activism. We've yeah, done it, it doesn't yeah, require a change of your life. We've asked questions <laughs> together. Um, I hope you feel you've got something. Uh, from tonight and um, if we didn't answer any of your questions or if you still have doubts that's a good thing it's good to question but it's also good to be wrong so be prepared if you know be prepared for that possibility and um, and look at the information on, on online and uh, hopefully we feel we hope that it will make sense so uh, does anyone have any uh, other questions if you want to come up and talk to us individually afterwards, that you know, like that might be a better way to do it. Because uh, um, so it's been quite very. Yeah. Minor, yeah. I mean, the, the trains train 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 don't run twenty-four hour in this yeah. system. Exactly. I'll be putting like um, an evaluation form on Facebook and on the London chapter website as it is now. And you can and if you can complete that we really really so thank you. Thank you very much guys. Yeah.